Okay, so uh, this presentation is about the RADAR study, which, as, as Claire said, was funded by the National Institute for Health Research, which is a UK government research funding organisation for health research. Uh, and the results were published in uh, the summer of 2022, 2023, sorry. <laughs> um, in the Lancet Psychiatry, and, and I'll be presenting them and also some other uh, more recent data that we've looked at. So my um, path to running the radar study started with my book on antipsychotics, which Claire mentioned, which is called The Bitterest Pills. It's called The Bitterest Pills because I think antipsychotics are some of the most unpleasant and dangerous medications out there. Um, I think uh, their nature is quite well expressed by the in the pictures of Brian Saunders, who's an American artist who paints self-portraits under the influence of various different substances. Uh, and I think those self-portraits convey uh, quite neatly what makes him feel good. Uh, so this is a self-portrait of um, him under the influence of marijuana, which he seems to quite like. And this is one of him under the influence of um, aripiprazole, uh, the fairly recent antipsychotic. Um, and that doesn't look as, as nice a picture, does it? And here's one of him under the influence of quetiapine. Um, again, he looks tense and troubled, not as if, as if he's not enjoying himself. And here's his uh, picture about geodon, uh, just as his prazodone. So I think I think those pictures express how unpleasant the experience of taking antipsychotics can be. It's also, I think, very nicely illustrated in this cartoon by Auntie Psychiatry, who, uh, who shows, I think, the contrast between the danger and risk, but also the excitement of a psychotic state and the dull grey normality that uh, antipsychotics can produce. And it's probably most starkly and um, movingly summed up, I think, in this quote from Peter Westcott in the British Medical Journal. Uh, he wrote an account of his psychosis and its treatment in 1979 um, and says that he thinks that sometimes the richness of his pre-injection days, even with brief outbursts of madness, may have been preferable to the numbed cabbage I have become. Um, in losing my periods of madness, I have had to pay with my soul and the price of health seems twice as high as Everest. And of course, we know that uh, they cause a lot of health damage. Um, they uh, make people put on weight. They cause diabetes, much higher rates of diabetes in people who are taking antipsychotics than the general population. They cause uh, sexual dysfunction very commonly, probably in the vast majority of people who take them to some extent. And over the last uh, 15, 20 years, there's been increasing evidence coming out that they cause shrinkage of the brain matter. Um, initially, the, uh, the scans that showed that people with psychosis or schizophrenia had smaller brains and larger brain cavities were thought to be evidence that schizophrenia was a brain disease. But there have now been animal studies and studies in humans showing that antipsychotics actually reduce brain matter while people are taking them. And they're also dangerous to the heart and associated with sudden cardiac death. And there's this very dramatic dose response curve for sudden cardiac death. So the the, the higher the dose you're on, the more likely you are, even though it's still unlikely, I, I should stress, but the more likely you are to um, have a, a heart attack or a sudden cardiac event, which can be fatal. Now, that's not to say that antipsychotics aren't useful in some situations, and I think that they are. Uh, I think that they do um, dampen down and reduce the intensity of acute psychotic symptoms. This is the results of a meta-analysis of uh, uh, showing their effects on the symptoms of psychosis. 
The question is, how is that effect achieved? And of course, the conventional view has been that uh, antipsychotics are targeting and, and addressing the underlying um, pathophysiological problem that produces psychosis. One of the main theories has been the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, which was proposed back in the 1960s and, uh, and hung on there, even though over the years the evidence has uh, been pretty inconsistent and certainly not compelling. In the 1970s, people were talking about, um, uh, you know, there being other other possible interpretations of the data. Um, the, the dopamine hypothesis has largely been based on the fact that antipsychotics can reduce psychotic symptoms. So it's been based on the assumption that they are doing that by targeting some underlying pathological process. Other evidence that's thought to, um, sorry, however, that's problematic because actually quite a lot of antipsychotics don't work primarily through dopamine, or at least some key antipsychotics don't work primarily through dopamine, um, particularly clozapine, which doesn't have particularly strong actions on the dopamine D2 receptor in particular, which has always been thought to be the one that's associated with psychosis. Other indirect evidence of the dopamine hypothesis, such as stimulant-induced psychosis, which of course exists and must be some chemical process, but actually has not been pinned down to dopamine, even though it is frequently suggested that it, that it has been. And direct measures of dopamine itself, dopamine metabolites and dopamine receptors are all negative or drug-induced. There's some indirect measures of dopamine um, activity, such as dopamine L-dopa uptake, um, and some of those studies have found positive effects, um, increased dopamine, uh, indications of dopamine activity, but only in people who are acutely psychotic uh, and, and distressed and, uh, and confused. And the trouble is that we know that dopamine is associated with uh, stress, movement, arousal, etc., all things that are likely to be perturbed in someone with an acute psychotic state. So overall, there's really um, no good evidence that that uh, antipsychotics work by correcting an underlying dopamine deficiency as uh, dopamine overactivity, sorry, as is suggested by the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia. Um, and I would suggest that a much more plausible explanation for their effect is the alterations to normal thinking and emotion and behaviour that antipsychotics produce. Is, is this thing blocking the screen for you as well? Can you see? Um, just wondering if you can see the top of my slides because I've got the bar from the Zoom thing blocking it. Maybe if I just put it down there, that would be helpful. Um, what we're seeing is antipsychotic induced alterations, et cetera. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry, I can't know. How's... Okay, there we are. Um, so th th these, these are some quotes from people about the effects of antipsychotics that seem to support this view. People describing how they dis decrease the intensity of, of symptoms like voices, um, stop thoughts and feelings being amplified and overwhelming, numb my brain. Uh, and, and of course, um, cause uh, um, sedative effects, calming and um, general uh, soothing. Um, I should say that that antipsychotics are are different. I'm not suggesting they're all the same. They come from different chemical classes and have different sorts, or subtly different sorts of effects. But they do seem to share the property of. Um, of reducing emotional intensity and, and having some sort of sedative effect, although aripiprazole is, seems to be much less sedating. Um, and, and this is an interesting study from, from the US that seems to again support this idea. It showed after six weeks of treatment people who, who had in people who had a psychotic episode that the main effect was on people's behavior, that people were basically calmer and less disturbed and less agitated. Um, and, their, and, and the next main effect was on their emotional involvement in their symptoms. They were less distressed by them um, and less preoccupied by them. But people's actual beliefs and, and um, 
uh, ability to see what was going on hadn't fundamentally changed in that time. So the next question is, so if that's what antipsychotics are doing, numbing and suppressing people's emotions and, and uh, initiative and motivations, um, is long-term treatment with antipsychotics useful? Now, the reason that we give long-term treatment is because of this idea that it will prevent people from having a relapse of their condition. Um, and that is supported by numerous randomized controlled trials that show that if you discontinue your antipsychotic medication, you have a much higher incidence of relapse here, this orange column here on the left, and of hospitalization, this orange column on the right, than people who maintain their antipsychotics, the blue columns. The trouble is there are lots of problems with those studies. Um, first of all, they are discontinuation studies. And most of them involve discontinuing people's antipsychotics abruptly. Uh, and we know that there are adverse effects of discontinuation, which are then likely to kick in. Um, also, they've had short term follow up. There are very few trials that have followed people up for more than a year. So you're going to be likely to picking up all, all those short term discontinuation effects. And there's little data on outcomes other than relapse. And there is also data from non-randomized controlled trials that suggests that overall people who avoid antipsychotic treatment do better in the long run in terms of their functioning and um, relapse rates uh, as well. Now, of course, that's going to be partly because, so that this, sorry, this is an example. This is the, the famous study by Harrow et al. done in Chicago, which showed that people um, with a diagnosis of psychosis or schizophrenia who were not taking antipsychotics had a much higher chance of being in recovery, the, the dotted line at the, the top, than people who continued taking them. Now, of course, that's going to be um, partly maybe largely even because people who avoid taking long-term antipsychotics um, are, are people who have a better prognosis anyway, people who can get off them. Um, but it may be, but, but they did control for prognostics and prognostic factors. So it may well be that there is uh, an, an inhibiting or debilitating effect of antipsychotics as well, that is um, making people's outcomes worse. This is another another one of these studies um, conducted in, in Denmark, I think. And uh, it's interesting because what it shows is you look at, and if you can see my cursor, if you look at this is this this is a social functioning score up the um vertical, the vertical axis. People who were in remission and not taking antipsychotics had a much higher social functioning score than people who were in remission but taking antipsychotics. And then people who were not in remission had lower um, social functioning scores. But again, people off antipsychotics were doing slightly better than people on antipsychotics. Nevertheless, this still could be um, due to uh, the effects of medication. Sorry, the, the effects of, of the underlying condition. Um, so this is why this study was really important. This study done in the Netherlands um, by Lex Wondrick and 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 colleagues wondering, um, and this study showed at the seven year follow up that people who had been randomized to have their antipsychotics gradually discontinued um, did much better in terms of recovery and recovery was principally in terms of social fu social functioning than people who continued on their medication. So sorry, the other, other way around in this graph, people who've been discontinued are the blue column and the orange columns are the people who um, uh, who were on maintenance therapy. And this is according to what they were randomized to. Not everyone in, who were, was randomized to reduction actually came off their medication. Um, in fact, lots went back on. Um, uh, but nevertheless, overall, there were higher rates of reduction of antipsychotics in that group than in the maintenance group. And even though the, the group that were randomized to discontinuation had higher rates of relapse to begin with, over the seven year period, rates of relapse evened out, which would be consistent with a discontinuation effect, with some, some it being something about the process of discontinuation that had led to relapse. 
So uh, I, I should mention that there's another long term follow up that, that that's not consistent with that view that shows that at 10 years, um, people had uh, a worse um, people who'd been briefly randomized to placebo in a placebo controlled quetiapine trial had worst outcomes at 10 years, although the authors have done something a bit tricky here. They've they've made a composite outcome, probably selected things that have made a worse outcome in this group. And actually, when you look at the uh, the, the social functioning scale scores at 10 years, there's no difference between the people who are randomized to placebo and the people randomized to quetiapine. In any case, this was a, a very different sort of original trial set up primarily um, to test the benefits of quetiapine as a, a relapse prevention medicine. So that's why, um, basically, various studies of antipsychotic reduction have been set up over the last few years, um, of which RADAR is one. Um, so there are also studies going on in the Netherlands. Um, Australia attempted a trial. They, they didn't manage to recruit very well and abandoned it, but, but they set one up nevertheless. Um, the Taylor study in Denmark as well um, also had problems recruiting. Um, and then there's uh, someone's done a little trial in Taiwan. Only only the trial in Taiwan and the radar trial have been with people with recurrent episodes of psychosis. All the others are in people with a first episode of psychosis. So the radar trial was a, a randomized control trial of a gradual antipsychotic reduction process. Um, compared to maintenance treatment in people with recurrent episodes of psychosis or schizophrenia. Um, we had an initial two-year follow-up uh, window, um, and, and those are the results that I'm going to present today. Those are the re results that have been published. We are currently doing a long-term, a longer-term follow-up. Um, our primary outcome was social functioning, um, because of the criticisms that other research has been far too focused on relapse. But we did also look at relapse, particularly severe relapses that required admission to hospital. And we looked at all sorts of other measures, quality of life, symptoms, etc. 